Good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here. It's a real honor and a pleasure to be able to uh, give my contribution to this uh, highly stimulating conference that addresses issues and topics that are at the core of my current research interests. And so I wish to express my special thanks to Nives Lenassi for inviting me to be one of the guest speakers. The topic of my presentation today is LSP teaching within a plurilingual perspective or a translanguaging perspective, as is known beyond Europe. And so during my presentation, I'm going to explain what a plurilingual perspective in language education is, and then I'm going to examine the refreshing changes that this new orientation is bringing about in the way in which we teach uh, specialized languages in higher education. So a plurilingual perspective embraces the principles of what is known as the multilingual term. Now, this new paradigm foregrounds multilingualism rather than monolingualism as the new norm of applied linguistic and sociolinguistic analysis. The multilingual term takes account of the complexities of languages in contact as they are used by plurilingual individuals when they engage in intercultural communication in their daily personal, social, academic and professional life. The multilingual term adopts an ecological model of language. Language is viewed as a semiotic ecosystem by means of which plurilingual individuals relate to the world and to each other using a multitude of signs, verbal, sensory, and kinesthetic. The multilingual term also endorses collaborative learning, which entails a mutual exchange of knowledge, skills, and competencies between teachers and students and students themselves. So students take an active role in the learning process. And this is perfectly in line with the principles of sociocultural theory developed by Lev Vygotsky in the 1970s. The multilingual term has contributed significantly to the revival of pedagogical translation in other bilingual practices in second language acquisition studies, bilingual education, and language teaching methodology and testing. So, given this premise, language policy makers in Europe are rising to the challenges posed by our increasingly multilingual societies by developing new competence frameworks in language education. And one such framework is laid out in the CFR companion volume with new descriptors. This is a document that was published in February 2018 and has been piloted and validated over the last two years. And the results of this systematic work is um, reported in a collected volume edited by North et al. The title, Enriching 21st Century Language Education the CFR companion volume examples from practice. This document will be out later this year. I'm really looking forward to reading the results of this uh, research work. So what is new about the new descriptors? Well, there is great emphasis on plurilingualism, which is linked 
to pluriculturalism and is presented as an uneven and changing competence which involves the ability to call flexibly upon an interrelated, uneven, plurilinguistic repertoire. Therefore, plurilinguals have a single interrelated repertoire that they combine with the general competencies and various strategies in order to accomplish tasks, tasks which require more than one language. And what are these tasks? Well, there is a long list. First of all, switching from one language or dialect or variety to another. And this is called co-switching or translanguaging. To express oneself in one language or dialect or variety and understand a person speaking another. This is called receptive bilingualism. Another task is to call upon the knowledge of a number of languages or dialects or varieties to make sense of a text. Another task is to recognize words from a common international store in a new guise. And also plurilingual individuals mediate between individuals with no common language or dialect or variety, even with only a slight knowledge oneself. They bring the whole of one's linguistic equipment into play, experimenting with alternative forms of expression. And finally, plurilingual individuals exploit paralinguistics, mind, gesture, facial expression, and so on. Remember the uh, ecological model of language, language viewed as a complex semiotic ecosystem? Well, that concept is reflected in the tasks listed in the companion volume with new descriptors. Let's focus on mediation. The activity of mediating between individuals with no common language or dialect or variety. This particular task requires spoken and written receptive and productive skills plus frequently interaction. But what does mediation actually entail? In mediation, the user learner acts as a social agent who creates bridges and helps to construct or convey meaning, sometimes within the same language, sometimes from one language to another. And in this case, we talk about cross-linguistic mediation. The context can be social, pedagogic, cultural, linguistic, or professional. So let's focus on cross-linguistic mediation. The, the new descriptors um, describe four different types of cross-linguistic mediation. The first one is relaying specific information in speech and in writing. And this involves explaining in language B, that is to say the new language, the language which is being learned, um, involves explaining in language B the relevance of specific information in a particular section of a long complete text written in language A. For example, an article, a website, a whole book, or a face-to-face -face or online talk. And the topics are um, deal, deal with current affairs or an area of personal interest or concern. And then the second um, cross-linguistic mediating task involves explaining data in speech and in writing. And by date, these data include um, graphs, diagrams, charts. A third cross-linguistic mediating task involves processing text in speech and in writing. For instance, summarizing a text written or uttered in language A and summarize it in language B. And then finally, the focus of our presentation today, 
translating a written text in speech and in writing. So I will move on now to examining the descriptors of the language abilities that are necessary for translating a written text at the higher levels of the um, language proficiency, which are the C1 and C2 levels of the CFR. But before we do that, let's read the introductory note. As in any case in which mediation across languages is involved, users may wish to complete the descriptor by specifying the language's concern. So we talk about language A and language B. Notice that the CFR does not address, does not deliberately address the issue of the mother tongue. Why? Because for the plurilingual individual, the mother tongue may not be the best language. And therefore, language A is considered to be the best language and language B is considered to be the new language, the language that is being learned. So given this important premise, which changes attitudes towards the goal of language education, which is that of developing plurilingual and pluricultural competence. So let's have a look now at the actual descriptors for the C1 level. Translating a written text in speech, when translating a written text in speech, learners can provide fluent spoken translation into language B, of complex texts written in language A on a wide range of general and specialized topics capturing most nuances. At C2 level, learners can provide fluent spoken translation into language B of abstract texts written in language A on a wide range of subjects of personal, academic and professional interest successfully conveying evaluative aspects and arguments, including the nuances and implications associated with them. Let's move on now to, oh no, let's summarize first of all. So translating a written text in speech is the process of giving a spoken translation of texts as varied as a notice, a letter, an email. It is largely an informal activity, fairly common in daily personal and professional life. And the key functional ability to, be, to uh, carry out this task involves capturing the source text nuances of meaning. Let me move on now to the descriptors for translating a written text in writing, which is the real focus of my presentation today. So at C1 level, learners can translate into language B abstract text on social, academic and professional subjects in his or her field written in language A, successfully conveying evaluative aspects and arguments, including many of the implications associated with them, though some expressions may be over-influenced by the original. So some interference is allowed, but at C2 level, learners can translate into language B technical material outside his or her field of specialization written in language A, provided subject matter accuracy is checked by a specialist in the field concerned. So, summing up, the whole competence model advocated by the new descriptors to the CEFR. Um, no, sorry, before, before I let's summarize, sorry, um, what uh, the main features the main requirements for translating a written text in writing. First of all, we must say that comparing with spoken translation, it is more formal, there is no doubt about this. It involves processing and articulating the source message in the target language. And 
translation is conceived as transfer of meaning from one natural language to another. So the model that is being advocated here in translation studies is called the instrumental model of translation. And the key functional abilities are comprehensibility of the target text, adherence to the relevant conventions in the target language, and capturing the source text nuances of meaning. So now let's summarize the entire competence model which underpins the act of translating a written text in writing at the higher levels of language proficiency. In order to become competent plurilingual and pluricultural individuals, persons, and this is the goal of language education in the 21st century, um, learners need to be able to mediate a variety of texts between the language they know best, which is language A, the source language, and the new language, which is language B, the target language. And one of the cross-linguistic mediation activities learners engage in is translating a written text in writing. And the aim is to achieve comprehensibility, fluency and accuracy in the target language. So we can identify three areas of competence, knowledge and skills that graduates in modern languages will have achieved by the time they complete the BA honours or a master's degree program. BA honours level, they're expected to achieve a level, a C1 level of uh, linguistic proficiency. And at master's degree level, they are expected to achieve a C2 level. So <clears throat> the three areas of competence are as follows. First of all, they will have acquired an understanding of translation as transfer of meaning from one language to another. They will also have acquired plurilingual competence as well as receptive, productive, and interactive skills, both in speech and in writing. They will have had much practice on translating text on social, academic, professional, and technical subject. So the question that naturally comes to my mind at this point is this, how are we scholar teachers rising to the challenges of implementing the recommendations contained in the CFR, particularly with regard to the role of translation in LSP teaching? Well, I'm going to answer this question by examining a small but representative sample of approaches and methods that are currently being used in LSP teaching in higher education, particularly in Europe. And in order to do so, I'm going to use the model developed by Richards and Rogers to analyze approaches and methods. And this um, model uh, consists of three elements, approach, design, and procedure. I'll go through each of them in turn. So the approach is underpinned by the principles of uh, a linguistic theory, also a theory of language learning, theory of translation, and also the principles of education of philosophy. The design consists of the general and specific objectives of the method, the syllabus model, types of learning and teaching activities, learner roles, teacher roles, the role of the instructional materials. And the procedure involves a description of daily of the daily classroom techniques, classroom practices, and classroom behaviors. So now I'm going to examine the first methodology that has been laid out in this very interesting paragraph, Learning Advanced Spanish 
through translation, authored by Caveres et al. And the aim of this textbook is to acquaint undergraduate students with the text typological conventions in both Spanish and English so that they can make informed translation decisions. Chapters one to three introduce translation theory and practice and the use of documentation resources. And chapters four to 11 deal with an array of text type, including audiovisual translation. And chapter 12 deals with the translation of language varieties, such as Span Spanglish. The book is also accompanied by a companion website where you can find an answer key, teacher's notes, activities, resources, and feedback. And now I'm going to give you an illustrative example of an activity taken from chapter two. All students in the classroom read, first of all, a text on the human reproductive system taken from Wikipedia. And then the class is divided into two groups. One group carries out this, this assignment, which um, aims to explain the uh, human reproductive system to um, primary school children, nine to 10 year old, uh, years old children. So they are the addressees, the receivers of this um, um, translated text. And the place of publication is a book which contains an interactive CD-ROM and it is aimed at a course on natural sciences. The second group is asked to translate the same text with a different objective. They have to translate it uh, for um, the Encyclopedia Libre and so the addressees are adult uh, readers without a specialized knowledge of biology and the place of publication is the internet so this is an online publication. Now the second uh, methodology I'm going to examine <coughs> is, excuse me, is laid out in a book authored by Dominic Stewart in 2018. And the title is Italian to English Translation with Sketch Engine, a guide to the translation of to this text. Now, <clears throat> this text is organized <clears throat> in 15 teaching units, and each unit contains a short text to be translated for an international readership requiring information on tourist sites in Italy. Then there is a suggested translation, sentence by sentence, which is based on successful versions submitted by students after two or more months training. And finally, there is a discussion on unsuitable equivalents or appropriate alternatives arising from rendering submitted by the students. The translations were carried out using online language resources, above all, electronic opera derived from, by, uh, derived from the web using the corporate software sketch engine. And in addition to this resource in the target language, there were also uh, online learner's dictionaries that students could um, interrogate, examine, and investigate. Now, by reading the entire book, you can see, you can identify four main categories of lexical and grammatical mismatches the students had to deal with when translating from Italian into English. The first category consists of noun phrasing containing toponyms. The second category concerns subject-specific terminology. The third category includes polywords or lexical phrases 
polywords are a special type of lexical phrase, and then language-specific collocations. I will focus on the first category, noun phrases containing toponyms. And here is the full list of um, these toponyms that had to be translated into English. Now, the first one is l'alto piano di Malga Fanta. So to be able to see how to translate uh, this toponym accurately, fluently, and comprehensibly, the student interrogated the web, or rather the web divide corpus using Sketch Engine, for the equivalent word, the English equivalent word of l'alto piano. And it is plato. And by analyzing the lexical grammatical profile of plato, they discovered that the accurate rendering, the equivalent of l'alto piano di Malga Fanta, is the Malga Fanta plato. So the strategy adopted require reordering the word order of the original expression. And so this technique was also used for other toponyms, l'isola di Barbana and the um, equivalents are the island of Barbana, the isle of Barbana or Barbana Island. Il lago Pradestua, Lake Pradestua, La Laguna di Grano, the Lagoon of Grado or Grados, Grados Lagoon, Il Monte Baldo, Mount Baldo, Il Passo di Fittanze della Sega, the Pass of Fittanze della Sega, Il Passo di Xomo, the Xomo Pass, Il Torrente Brasa, the Brasa Stream, and finally La Valle dell'Adige or La Vallata dell'Adige, dell is translated with the Adige Valley or Adige Valley without the definite determiner. So this is the fruit of the student's labor. And the teacher plays the role here of a facilitator, of a guide. And in fact, Dominic Stewart has shared this little secret, secret with me. He said, my students try to outperform it. They join a really, um, they are almost in competition with me and they, they try to outperform it. So they try to even be better uh, than their own teacher. And this is, and this is good because it, is, it shows how collaborative learning um, enables students to take an active uh, role in the learning process. Learners are active participants in learning. Now, the third methodology I'm going to illustrate is laid out in the, uh, this book I authored um, and is just been published, Linking Worlds, a cross-linguistic, um, a course book on cross-linguistic mediation. It consists of 12 teaching units containing an introduction, an explanation of linguistic concepts, illustrative examples from a wide range of specialized texts, exercises in lexical and morphosyntactic analysis, discussion of the translation problems that may arise when there are cross-linguistic and cross-cultural differences, Translation tasks into and from Italian as language A, level C1 plus for language A, and finally, a summary of the main points. There is also chapter, a chapter devoted on additional mediation tasks, and we'll look at them in a moment. But before I move on to the illustrative examples, um, the book is accompanied by a digital workbook English Lexis, Grammar and Translation, authored by Richard D. G. Braithwaite. The book is organized in 12 units. 
The activities contain examples of real life language use taken from a wide variety of sources, such as newspapers, magazines, tourist brochures and billboards, advertising, BBC comedy, songs, poetry, novels, academic writing and websites. And here is an example of activity taken from chapter four. Wordplay in promotional text. So this is advertising in a way, well, a type of advertising. Um, we students are invited to identify and analyze the puns used in the following text. Of course, puns are fully explained in the textbook, linking worlds. These are additional activities. So what they are uh, going to um, analyze is the title of a tourist guide, which reads Effetto Puglia, guida cine turistica a una regione tutta da girare. And of course, the pun is the pun in word is girare, which uh, this is a polysemantic pun um, because it relies on the polysemy of the word girare, which means to tour and to tour around and also to film. The other text that students are invited to um, analyze is taken from a promotional leaflet by Gruppo Assicurativo Poste Vita and it reads Affida i tuoi investimenti a chi ti sa guidare and the funny word is guidare which means, uh, which may mean um, both uh, to guide and to drive, to drive a car. And this is a, another polysemantic um, pun, and it is also an iconic pun because the pun is disambiguated by the image. And then the third um, pun with students have to analyze it's also taken from a promotional leaflet by Gruppo Assicurativo Poste Vita and it reads la protezione che ti assicura il sorriso and the funny word is assicura which means ensures and also guarantees so after analyzing the source text the students translate them and translate into English text, reproduce an exercise for three above, and explain the procedures adopted to deal with wordplay. So they need to um, analyze, in particular, the strategies uh, put forward by De, de la Bastida in a special issue of the translator dedicated to wordplay. Of course, these strategies are fully explained and also illustrated in the textbook. This is extra practice for them. And this is taken from the key chapter of the um, digital workbook. Effetto Puglia, Guida Città Turistica, una regione tutta da girare, a travel guide to film locations around Apulia. In this case, there is pun, non pun, because there is, there, it is impossible uh, to render the original pun because the polysemy, uh, the original polysemy, does not travel across languages. There is also another possibility. Uh, it can be translated with Apulia, a film tourist guide. And again, the strategies is pun, non pun. The second example, Affida i tuoi investimenti a chi ti sa guidare, is being translated but with entrust your investment to those who can guide you. Again, pun, non pun. Only one of the meanings of the pun in word has been rendered in English. And then this final strategy, la protezione che ti assicura il sorriso, the cover that will put a smile on your face. Here we got another strategy. The original pun has been translated with a related rhetorical device. In this particular case, an idiom, to put a smile on one's face. 
protect your smile is another uh, example of another strategy, pun to zero. So the punning word has not been translated at all. Now, let me move on now to some activities, the three activities presented in the last chapter of the textbook. And they are devoted to other cross-linguistic mediating activities. Do you remember Spe relaying specific information from an, an original text into the target language? Well, this is an example. Um, on the right hand side, you see the brief, the set of instructions. You are a language teacher, a language teacher trainee in a high school in Italy. Your class is composed of learners of English at European level B2. Before assigning a reading comprehension task based on an article on volunteer tourism by Lila Schubert, your tutor asks you to help students understand the contents of the article by relaying the following specific information in Italian. The difference between volunteer tourism and disaster tourism, the extent of the damage caused by the 2015 earthquake in Nepal, and what volunteer tourists were allowed to do in Nepal after the earthquake. Another activity requires understanding, explaining charts and diagrams and graphs. And so here it is, here is an example. You are an undergraduate student of modern languages majoring in English. Your three months traineeship involves providing language assistance to a dietitian who has several English speaking clients. Explain to one of them the main, main characteristics of the recommended Mediterranean diet as they are illustrated in the food pyramid. Mm, I must say that these additional mediating activities do not have a suggested answer in the key section. So they are really open to um, a full discussion in class whereas all the translation tasks have a key um, containing suggested translations provided by myself and also Richard Braithwaite. The third activity involves summarizing the original text. So here is the brief. An English friend of yours has just graduated in agriculture at Nottingham Trent University. She would like to spend a gap year doing voluntary work in an overseas country. Summarize in English the main contents of the article by Lucia Tomassini, published on the website of Le News on 21st March 2014. And the title is Voluntarismo, Impegno Civile e Turismo. So, what can we say about the approach, design and procedures adopted by the methods elaborated by um, these um, scholar teachers and also professional translators? Um, Dominic Stewart, Carrere Setal and myself and also Richard Braithwaite are also um, teachers, researchers and also professional translators. Well, the approach draws on the ecological model of language. You can see there is the use of online resources. There is also the use of visuals, iconic puns. So there is uh, multimodality and also the use of verbal signs. Um, translation studies, the theory of translation studies, the instrumental model of translation is adopted by all the authors of these books. That is to say, translation is a form of transfer of meaning from one natural language to another. And then as regards learning theory, the principles of social constructivism are adopted, which 
endorses collaborative learning. And as regards the education of philosophy, the uh, philosophies that really inspire these methodologies are, first of all, uh, technological. The technological educational perspective um, foregrounds the importance of um, serving practical purposes, providing individuals in society with necessary skills, both general and specialized. So, for instance, the skill, the ability to translate for academic, professional, pedagogic purposes. Also, the use of corpora, the use of sketch engine, the use of the internet. There is also another um, educational, educational perspective that inspires these methodologies, and that is the academic educational perspective. Education should preserve, develop, and transmit knowledge and understanding of an academic discipline. And this case is linguistics and translation studies. Um, all books, in fact, contain a section or different sections on translation theory as well as linguistic theory. If we move on now to design, well, design teachers' role and students' role within collaborative learning. So they're both active participants in the learning process. And also, as regards Dominic Stewart's book, uh, Dominic Stewart draws on data-driven learning developed by Tim Jones. And Charlotte will remember that this um, was actually, we learned together about the data-driven learning um, approach when we attended many years ago, a fantastic, memorable um, workshop with Susan Hanston in Cambridge. And so, because we are uh, adopting a collaborative learning, um, the teacher is a facilitator, a guide in the learning process, and students are active participants. The procedure, the procedure is prepared. sometimes it's up, sometimes it's down, and it involves a variety of bilingual activities. What what do I mean by bottom up and top down? Well, um, Mundo Sem Palabras adopts a top down process because it is text based. It's based on the different types of texts, whereas my approach is bottom up. It starts from morphology and then it moves on to, from, so it starts with the structure of words and therefore morph morphology, then the words, grammatical functions, and then the phrase, and then the sentence. And it goes up to the sentence level. And Dominic Stewart is bottom up. Uh, really, because it focuses very much on problematic um, node words, problematic node words such as toponyms, for instance, or specific collocation or specific terminology. So there is a mixture of these um, two different approaches. So uh, where do we go from here? Well, uh, it is my contention that in order to unlock the full potential of pedagogical translation as a form of cross-linguistic mediation in LSP teaching, we would benefit from the contribution of an array of disciplinary fields. LSP studies, first of all, educational linguistics, translation studies, second language acquisition studies, bilingual education, and contact linguistics. And this transdisciplinary orientation is gaining ground. We have a journal, Translation and Translanguaging in Multilingual Context. TTMC provides a forum for the innovative studies that find their place at the crossroads between translation studies and bilingual education, language teaching methodology, second language acquisition, 
curricular design and language policy and planning. And also we have three important collected volumes. The first one is Uber Zetsung, edited by Engel and Kangata, and the title translated into English is translation, the possibility of thinking about pedagogy in a different way. This book, um, I contributed a chapter to this book, but the main, uh, mm, the main contributors are all educationalists, language educationalists. And the um, point they want to make, what they want to promote is um, a new conception of educational theory. theory. Educational theory is viewed as a form of cultural translation work that hosts unfamiliarity and strangeness, and also translation is conceived as a form of learning, and especially learning to live with the plurality of languages and their incompatibility. So translation as pedagogy, pedagogy as translation. The second volume has been published very, very recently, edited by Tian et al. And the title is Envisioning Tiso Through a Translanguaging Lens. The aim is to open a critical conversation about English teaching and learning by re-examining TESO through a translanguaging lens and the contributions reflect diverse views in TESO scholarship from five continents. The authors respond to the multilingual term in language education and challenge the monolingual orthodoxy and the native speakerism paradigm by valuing the linguistic resources or repertoires of individuals holistically. And then the third, last but not least, the last uh, volume is the Routledge Handbook of Translation Education, edited by myself and Maria Gonzalez Davis. The goal pursued by the 26 contributors to the volume is to lay a sound foundation for the future cooperation between translation scholars and educationalists. And to this end, the volume adopts a transdisciplinary perspective and presents the state of the art of the place and role of translation in a variety of educational contexts worldwide, from primary education up to master's degree level and also heritage language and bilingual education. So just to conclude, all I can say now is the future looks bright for the revival of pedagogical translation in LSP, in LSP teaching within a plurilingual perspective on education. Thank you very much for your attention.